Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this morning, written in our heart, written in our mind. We do take hold of it. We will apply it. We thank you for all that you're bringing forth in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to talk to you about the subject of God's love towards you and your love towards God. It is essential that you understand the love of God. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. He has a great love. Don't ever, don't ever doubt God's love. Don't ever think it's, it's love is just a little bit of love. It is a great love that he has loved us. What did he do with that great, because of that great love? Even when we were dead in sins, he's quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. He brought salvation to us because of the grace of God, the favor of God. That is the great love that he's accomplished for us. We see over in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. It speaks of him as the God of love. 2 Corinthians 13, that is. Verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. He is a God of love. And he wants to be with you. But I want you to notice, it's not automatic. Because notice it says all these things. These are commanding statements. Here where it says to be perfect, this particular word means for you to be thoroughly prepared, put in order, restored, repaired, made ready. When you look it up in the Greek lexicons, become complete, the completed work in your life. To be of good comfort, be encouraged, this refers to. To be of one mind, otherwise one way of thinking in line with his word and to live in peace. He wants us to live in peace with everybody. And then it says, the God, the God of peace, God of love and peace shall be with you. He wants to manifest himself in your life to accomplish all the great things that he has promised in his word. Over in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7, he says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Well, if you're not walking in love towards others, it says, you know, you're not really knowing God. You're not, obviously, you're not really born of God or knowing God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is a God of love. He loves you, and he wants you to love one another at all times. It is absolutely mandatory. If you don't walk in love, the Bible says you don't know God. We should not ever have anything going on in our life that cause us to go outside of the way of love. We see over in 1 John 4, verse 16, he says, We have known and believed the love that God has to us. You need to know it and you need to believe it. Don't doubt his love towards you. You need to believe it, know it, the love that God has for you. God is love. At the same time, you're to dwell in love. If you dwell in love, you will dwell in God and God will dwell in you. We must understand that the Father loved Jesus. He sent Jesus in order to accomplish the redemption for us. And we see in John chapter 3, down in verse 35, it says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. The word for love here is agape, which is a word which realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the worth of an individual. It is unconditional unreserved love. The Father had that kind of love for the Son. And he wants, of course, for, he has the same kind of love for us, and he wants us to have the same kind of love for everybody else. Everybody is valuable, precious, and of great worth. You are valuable and precious of great worth. Don't ever think negative about yourself. God does not view you that way. He thinks of you as valuable and precious and of great worth. And that is important. You have a true self-image of yourself according to what God says in his word. John chapter 5 verse 20 it says something a little bit different. For the father loveth the son. This time the word is a different word. It is not the word agape. For you here the first time this is a program which has tremendous capabilities and it brings up the Strong's number 
This is according to Strong's Concordance, the Greek word, and also meanings of it and other information here. So it says the Father is loving the Son, and this is the word phileo. This is a word which refers to having a tender affection or being fond of or pleased towards, and that is because of conditions being met. You must understand that God's love is unconditional in one aspect, but it is conditional in another aspect, because he doesn't automatically manifest himself to everybody. It's only for those who meet the conditions, as you will see. And so here it's speaking of not the fact that he had this unconditional love, but this is a love, he was fond of him, he was pleased with him because he did the things that the Father told him to do. As you do the things that God tells you to do in his word, then you will see his love being manifest towards you. God wants us to understand that. We see over in John chapter 10, verse 17, he says this, Therefore doth my Father love me, it's agape love, a love that realizes that unconditionally, the valuables, the preciousness of him, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Jesus was willing to come and he was willing to pay, lay down his life to pay the price for sin in order to accomplish redemption so that we all could be born again and we could come out of bondage to the enemy and come into relationship with the Lord. And the Father loved him because of this. We must see that the Father loves those who will walk in the ways of the Lord. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 7, down in verse, beginning in verse 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, you see an oath talking about being sworn unto your fathers, that means a covenant. He's made a covenant relationship with them. He follow, he obeys this word of his covenant. Because he loved you and because of this covenant, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He brought him out. In like manner, he has brought you and I out because of the promises of God and the prophecy that he's given of what Jesus would accomplish to bring us out of Satan's authority. Pharaoh's a type of Satan. Egypt is a type of the world. You and I have been brought out of it as so we come into relationship with the Lord. We're born again. And then he goes on and he says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God. He is faithful and you can trust in him to perform his word, which keeps covenant, all the covenant promises, and mercy, his mercy towards us. The mercies of God are new every morning. That's the love of God in action to minister to our needs and bring promises to pass. Who? With them that love him. Notice now it's got a qualifying statement with those that love him. So these are the ones who meet his conditions. God loves us unconditionally in that he sent Jesus to die for us so he brings salvation. But he also, we must understand that he loves us and will keep covenant and mercy if you love him. It's for those who love him. And who are the ones who love him? Not just because you say you love him. It's because you keep his commandments. He says the one who keeps the commandments through a thousand generations, that's the one that shows that he loves him. And when you love the Lord, he will keep covenant, he will perform his promises, and mercy, the mercies of God, the love of God in action to bring forth the promises of God in your life, they will come. But notice what he says in verse 10, because he's a covenant-keeping God. And he will repay them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Those who, even though he loves everybody and paid the price, sent Jesus to pay the price, the ones who hate him, who reject Jesus, and who do not love him, they will be repaid. God will treat you as you treat him. You love him? He will love you. You hate him? Well, you're going to be repaid. You're going to be repaid to your face of destruction because of not responding to what God has done. Because of the fall of man, man has been under Satan's dominion and he is under spiritual death until Jesus came and paid the price in order to accomplish the way of salvation. Now everyone who receives Jesus and is born again 
comes into relationship with them, comes as passed from spiritual death into spiritual life when they're born again and they get a brand new spirit on the inside of them. He goes on and says, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which I command thee this day to do them. God brought you into covenant relationship and he expects you to keep the commandments, the statutes, the judgments of the Lord to do them. He's given you his word and he expects you to be a doer of that word. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments, keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep with thee unto thee the covenant and mercy which he sware unto his fathers. In other words, again, here we see the conditions. Because you keep and do the word, that means you're loving him, keeping his commandments. And what's God going to do? Then he's going to keep covenant and mercy. He will bring forth his promises. In other words, the promises will not automatically come to pass in your life unless you follow the way of the Lord. If you will do what his word says, then you have the absolute confidence that he will perform his word in your life. And notice it says he will love thee. You do what he says, he will love thee. Now God's going to come and manifest himself to you. He'll love thee, he'll bless thee, he'll multiply thee. He'll bless the fruit of thy womb, fruit of thy land, the corn, wine, oil, increase of thy kind, flocks of thy sheep, and the land where he swear unto the fathers to give you. He'll bless you in everything that you do. God's blessings will come upon you. God wants to bless you. He doesn't want evil things to come upon you. But why do evil things happen? It's not because God's causing it, or it's not because God's, quote, allowing it in a sense that he could stop it. No, he's given you and I a choice. He's set before us life and death, blessing and cursing. We can choose what we want. In fact, we see over in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. He tells you, you've got to make a choice. Every one of us has a free will. We can choose. We can choose the right way that brings life and blessing, or we can choose the wrong way that brings death, and cursing, destructive things. It says, Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, because you choose the right way, shows that you love him. If you choose and reject his way and walk a wrong way, that shows you don't love him. Otherwise, you put the word of God first place and you'd obey and do all that he tells you to do, because his way is right. And that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. See, the one who really loves him obeys him. The one who really loves him cleaves unto him, adheres to him, sticks to him, because he's your life. He's your length of days, determining what kind of lifespan you have. And that, may dwell, that you might dwell in the land the Lord gave unto your fathers, which is all a type of the promised land, which you and I dwell in, in the promised land, possessing the promises of God in our life. You must understand that God's love is, is an everlasting love. Don't ever doubt God's love for you. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God's love is everlasting. It doesn't, it's not for just a short season. It is everlasting. He's always reaching out. Even if you turn away from him, he will chase after you throughout your days to try to draw you back to choose the way of the Lord. He calls you to repentance. He wants you to get right with him. As many as he loves, he'll come to correct and draw, tell them to come to repentance in their life. He has an everlasting love. And if you're going to see God manifest himself to you, and if you're going to see his love be shown for you, you've got to meet his conditions. Psalms 146, verse 8, he says this, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, the Lord raises them that are bowed down, the Lord loveth the righteous. Those who are righteous are the ones he loves. Now, when you get received Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, get a spirit that's right with God, you are righteous in spirit. But that's not all there is to righteousness. Some people have thought that that's all there is. No, not so. Those who are righteous are righteous across the board. What does unrighteousness produce? Sin, sin produces unrighteousness. You're not righteous anymore when you walk in the ways of sin. God wants us to be walking in his ways and doing what he says. 
we see in 1 John 3, 7 something important. He says, little children, let no man deceive you. Why would the word say, don't let anybody deceive you? It's because the subject that he's talking about in his foreknowledge, he knows that the teaching that has gone forth has deceived people and had not told them the truth. And the teaching is that once you're born again, you're perfectly righteous and everything's fine forevermore. Not so. That's a lying teaching. He goes on and says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. The word doeth, I put the cursor over it. We can show you important things in the Greek about the tense voice and mood of verbs, and they're very important to know what's being said. The tense of the verb doeth is the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action. In other words, it's saying, he who is doing continuously righteousness. Young's literal translation that we put below, the YLT here, he who is doing, that would be the proper way to translate it from the Greek. Is doing the righteousness is righteous. Otherwise, the Lord loves the righteous, and those are the ones that are born again and are doing righteousness. Because what happens if you walk in the ways of sin? Uh, you're not going to be righteous any longer. All unrighteousness is sin. You walk in the ways of sin, you have unrighteousness in your life. Well, what do I do? What can I do about that? Can I do something about it? You sure can. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, you can confess your sins and he will forgive you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The unrighteousness can be cleansed, eliminated. God will remember your sins and iniquities no more. That's why it's mandatory. When you do commit sin, anything that's unrighteous or contrary to his word, you can be sure you confess that sin. and You receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness and come back in relationship with Him. God's love is also shown in the fact that He will correct us. We need to be corrected. We know that as we, if you have children, you're well, a father or mother, you would correct your child. Make sure that they weren't going down the wrong path. Proverbs 3.12 for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. We correct our children because we love them. We don't want them to go down the wrong path. God corrects us, his children, so we will not go down the wrong path. Even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. God will correct you. That is his love. Be ready to receive his correction and change your way and walk in the right way before the Lord. Over in John chapter 14, we see the ones that really love him. In verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. The one who keeps his commandments is going, or excuse me, the one who really loves the Lord is going to keep his commandments. He shows the fact that he really loves the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes down in verse 21 and expounds further on this. And he says, He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You see, God loves us, but at the same time, we're to love him. That's our response back to him. He first loved us, that's why we love him. So as he's loved you, if you don't respond back and love him, then you have rejected his love, and you're going to be under judgment. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loved me. How do I get his commandments? They're in the word. Remember, we're under the New Testament, so we get all the t commandments that are under the New Testament, all the commanding statements that are made. But also, we don't just find out about them and have them and learn about them. We keep them. We do them. We carry them out in our life. Just knowing something means nothing unless you incorporate them into your lifestyle. Just because you know something doesn't mean anything. You've got to know it before you can do it, but you need to do the things that you know. That's what shows. That shows, like we talked about, there's finished a series on fruit. You know them by their fruits. The guy who has fruits, the one who's doing it and carrying it out. So you get his commandments by getting in the Word and studying the Word. And you keep them. That's the one who loves him. And look at what's going to happen. He that loves me, because he's met the condition. See, 
His, God's love toward us is unconditional in the fact of what God has done through Jesus to bring salvation. But it's also conditional, as we see here, for him to come and manifest himself to you. Because it says, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. That means unless you meet the condition, you're not going to be loved of the Father in the sense that he's going to come and manifest himself. He says, I will love him and will manifest myself to him. He's not going to come and accomplish his promises and do the things he wants in your life. Just because you're in covenant relationship doesn't mean things automatically happen. The lying teaching out there in the body of Christ is that God's in control of all things that happen to me. Not so. You have the choice. He's given you a free will. You can choose the right way or the wrong way. God has nothing to do with the choices that you make. You're in charge. The results that come, of course, God's in control in a sense because His Word is the judge. You choose wrong, curses are going to come. His Word declares it. You choose right, blessings are come. His Word declares it. But He said, make you choose. So never blame God for things that you chose. No, He's given you a free will and He expects us to choose the right way. And then he says he'll love us and he'll come and he will manifest himself to us. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. If you really love the Lord, your response is you're going to keep the word of God. You can't say out of one corner of your mouth that I love the Lord and then you're doing all these other things or saying all these other things or walking in all these other ways and think that it really was genuine. No, you can't fool God. If you really love him, you will keep his words. And then he says, what's going to happen? My father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That means God's going to come and manifest himself in your life. If God comes and makes his abode, his dwelling place in you, what's going to happen when the presence of God comes? The blessing of God comes. Remember, even in the Old Testament, when the ark where the presence of God was manifest was in the house of Obed-Edom, the whole house was blessed. Wherever the presence of God is manifest, there will be blessings. And God wants blessings to come on you and to overtake you in your life in all areas. Well, we've got to keep his words. That shows that you really love the Lord. John chapter 16, verse 27. For the Father himself loveth you. Now we see the word phileo. Remember, that's conditions. Agape is unconditional. Phileo shows conditions because you're doing things that he wants you to do. He's, you're fond of you. He's pleased with you. He's a friend to you because you've shown yourself worthy of that by meeting conditions. The Father himself loveth you, phileo, because, or approved he can even mean, because you have loved me. Otherwise, you love Jesus. Now the Father's going to love you and have believed that I came out from God. That's why if you don't believe and receive all the things that Jesus has accomplished, then the Father is not going to be loving you. He loves you as you receive all the things that Jesus Christ has accomplished for you in your life because of the conditions met. We see in John chapter 17, verse 23, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. That's what you and I are to come to the place of being to come to the place of perfection in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them. Jesus was sent, and he's loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. He loved Jesus from before the foundation of the world because you know, he knew what he was going to be accomplishing. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me, this is the love that the Father had towards Jesus, may be in them, and I in them. What does that tell you? God's love, the same love, is to be in you. So God's love is towards you, and he will come and manifest when he meets the need, when you meet the conditions, that is. But also, the same love is to come and be in you. He wants the love of God dwelling in you, that you are walking in him. When you're dwelling in God and he's dwelling in his word, he's going to dwell in you and you're going to dwell in love, you're going to see God's great blessings come forth. 
God loves us unconditionally, but he also loves us conditionally in order to bring the promises of God to pass. We, of course, see the fact that he loved the world unconditionally. John 3, 16, so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave Jesus. He loved the world. It was unconditional. This is agape. It wasn't, there were no conditions whatsoever. He loved the world in order to bring forth Jesus to accomplish redemption. We see over in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God commended, or this means to really to present and show and prove forth, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Otherwise, we didn't make any changes before he died for us. He did it while we were in the state we were in. He came when we were in this position we were in, not because of us doing something. He showed an unconditional love towards you and me. He died on behalf of us in order to bring forth the redemption so we could come out of Satan's bondage. In Titus chapter 3, we see over in verse 4, After that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man, toward mankind, this is, the, this is where we get our word philanthropia, philanthropy from. It's philanthropia in the Greek, the love of mankind. So the kindness and love of God towards man appeared. It came. That God's love towards mankind shows up. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing. And the word washing is the word lutron, which means bathing. It's not talking about just washing away of sins. It's talking about the bathing of the whole person, which is what happens to us essentially when the presence of God comes upon us when we receive Jesus and the old spirit's taken out and a new spirit comes into us because he calls it the bathing of regeneration. And what's the word regeneration? It means new birth. Otherwise, he saved us through the new birth. That's why everybody has to be born again. Just believing in Jesus doesn't get it done. Many believe in Jesus, but never have received him and been born again. You have to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior, and you get born from above. And he showed forth his great love toward us by bringing forth the new birth in our life. And that's what he wants us, every single person in the world, to receive Jesus Christ. That's why you need to be out there preaching the gospel to everybody, sharing the word with them telling them they must be born again, showing them what God has done. His love was toward them while they were in their state in order to see them be able to have a way to come out of it and to come into relationship with God. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive, perceive we the love of God, because he, hath a laid, he laid down his life for us. And we then, our response, ought or we owe to lay down our lives for the brethren. He did everything for us we should be willing to reach out and minister to other people's needs. Otherwise, you can't live a selfish life. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to live a life to reach out to minister to other people's needs. He goes on and he says, Whoso hath this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He's living a selfish life. He just living unto himself instead of living to, unto God and being a vessel for God to flow through him. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. No, it's got to be in more than that, just words or what we might say. But in deed and in truth, in your action and in truth according to the word of God. It's going to be shown by action, isn't it? Words mean nothing. Talk means nothing. It's the walk, isn't it? Anybody can have the talk. Lots of people have the talk. But how about the walk? That's where it comes down to finding out whether you're the real deal or whether other people are. That's how we know them, by their fruit in their life. 1 John chapter 4, in verse 9, he says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Otherwise, we don't have any life unless we receive Jesus. You say, what do you mean? I have life. I'm alive physically. That life is going nowhere without Jesus, because when you die, you're going to go down to hell. Your body just going back to the dust of the ground. The only way you have life is when you have eternal life. 
by receiving a new spirit on the inside of you right with him so you can go to heaven. That we might live through him. You and I only have life once we receive Jesus. Everybody else just has bios, but it's, but it's not eternal life or life that will continue on. Instead, they will end up being in hell. Goes on and he says, Here is, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Love reaches out not based on what someone else does. Not that we love God and so he decided to love us. No, he loved us first and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. When it talks about the propitiation, this means the, means the reconciling sacrifice for forgiveness. When you study this out. He was the reconciling sacrifice for forgiveness to pay the price for sin so that we could be reconciled unto God. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself because he took all of our sins upon him and bore them away. So we then could be, our sins would be remitted and washed away and cleansed. We see down in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought or owe also to love one another. You see, your loving of one another is really one of debt. You owe love towards everybody because God's loved you. It's not because I decide whether I'm going to do it or not. God loved you. You have a debt to everybody to love them. You are expected to love every person regardless. That's why you even love your enemies, as the Bible says in the New Testament. You show love to every person, every single person. You're to walk in love at all times. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. Well, that would also mean if we don't love one another, God's not dwelling in us. He's not manifesting himself in us at all. If you do love one another, though, he comes to dwell in you, and his love is perfected in us. Because your love is to come to the place of being perfected in your life. You're to grow up and increase and abound in love and come to the place where you are walking in love at all times in your life. The love of God is to be perfected in your life. In verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Otherwise, our love to him is a response because of what he's done for us. He loved us, we love him. And dealing with people, you love them, it's not a response to what they've done to you. That's the world's way. If you love me, I'll love you. You scratch my back, oh, I'll, I'll be nice to you. That's what the world does. No, you love every person regardless of how they treat you. It's irrelevant. You are commanded to love everyone. That is your debt to mankind. Just as Jesus loved us in our state, regardless of what it was, you're to love everybody else in their state, regardless of what it is. That doesn't mean you're going to manifest yourself and be f f friends and fellowship with them. No, you're not. We're talking about you loving them in order to give the gospel to them and to minister to them and having the right perspective and attitude towards them. Otherwise, if you have any hatred in your heart, you're in trouble. You can't have hatred in your heart and think you're right before the Lord. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Hey, there's something happening on the inside of me. I love everybody now because you have passed from death unto life. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Well, you're in trouble. And then he goes on in verse 15. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. Well, I thought a murderer was only someone that did an evil act. No, it's all of the heart. Remember, when Jesus came, brought the new covenant, he, he brought forth in the new covenant the way things really are. It's all of attitude of heart. Just like it's not just committing the act of adultery. It's if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you committed it. It's all an attitude of heart. Here he says, you hate your brother. That's an attitude of heart on the inside. You're a murderer. It's as if you've murdered him. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, that tells you something. Just because you got born again, that doesn't mean you've got eternal life forever. If you let hatred get in your heart, you're a murderer and you will have no eternal life in you. Otherwise, you, God loves you to do something for you by sending Jesus unconditionally. But now, for God's love to be manifest in you and his mercy towards you, including his eternal life, you're going to meet his conditions. 
you're going to meet his conditions. Remember, his manifested love to you is conditional upon you meeting the conditions and doing the things that God has told you to do. We see in Revelation. See, we've got to have the truth about love, not this love that God loves us regardless of what we do, and it doesn't matter what we do. That's the lot of teaching out there. It's false. Yes, he does love us, and in fact, unconditionally, that he sent Jesus so we, we could be born again and, and be saved and come in a relationship with him. But remember, love has two aspects. It also has the conditional aspect. He only loves those who meet his conditions in order to manifest himself. Revelation 1.5 from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. He showed his love toward us. And he washed us, bathed, the word luo, bathed us from our sins in his own blood. They have been washed away. He remembers your sins and iniquities no more. When you are born again, you are brand new on the inside of you. And he's made us kings and priests unto God. He's brought us into that. You now are a king. You're a priest unto God and you are to rule and reign, and you are to walk in relationship with God and be a royal priest, ruling and reigning, a holy priest, ministering unto him, fellowshipping with the Lord, walking in the ways of the Lord. We see over in Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the new us that comes when we get born again. The life which I now live in the faith, flesh, by the, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus gave himself for us, so that now you and I can live by the faith of the Son of God. Otherwise, we're expected now to live that way. We can't live in the flesh. We can't live according to our own ways. No, we're to live by the faith of the Son of God and walk in the line of the ways of the Word of God. We even see... This really pointed towards what the Lord has done for us, even in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 38, in verse 17. Look at the love it shows thee. He says, for, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back, or in the New Testament, washed them away. That's God's love to your soul. If your sins couldn't be washed away, your soul would be totally messed up. Will, intellect, and emotions. You'd be bound by the sin. No, he's washed that away. So now you have been cleansed from all that in the New Testament. We now can be, have him washed away. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love, this is agape love, this unconditional love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Actually, when you think about it, the love of God is so amazing that you and now and I have come to be sons of God, offspring of God, children of God. We're in the, have the same spirit of Jesus Christ in us that Jesus has, the very same spirit Christ is in us. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not, of course. You and I are now the sons, or really the word sons means the children. It's the word technon, which really is children. There's a different word for the word sons in the Greek. You and I are the children of God. We now are his offspring. We belong to him. God has commanded us to love him. So we've seen that it's got an unconditional aspect, but there's also a conditional aspect. We want to look at these things because these are things, not only do we need to understand God's love for us, but also our love for him, the conditions that you and I are expected to meet. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Every bit of you. Your heart, that's the inner man on the inside of you. That's where your motivation is. Your motivation should be always towards the Lord. You want to do the things that he wants you to do. Your soul it's made up of your will, your intellect, and your emotions. So you're going to love him shown by your, from your will because of your choices. You're going to choose the right thing. Because of your mind and your in mindset, what you're thinking upon, where you have your mind focused upon. Your emotions, you're letting your, govern your emotions in line with the word of God, not letting the flesh run you whatsoever. So your soul is to be yielded unto the Lord. 
And with all your might, all of your being, you are to love him. God expects us to love him. We see over in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require? This is required of them. But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. See, if someone really has the, the love of God and is loving him, they're going to have the fear of God. They're going to walk in his ways. They're going to serve the Lord and do the things that he has commanded them to do. We see in chapter 11, verse 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, keep his charge, or keep his commands, and his statutes, and judgments, his commandments, always. Otherwise, we just don't keep them whenever we feel like it. We keep them always. We walk in the ways of the Lord at all times in our life. Verse 22, he says, For you shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. <clears throat> cleave unto him. <clears throat> then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you'll possess greater nations and mightier than, your, than yourselves. Well, what was this? This is all the enemies. So notice, if you keep the commandments of God, and you do them, that shows you're loving the Lord, evidence because you're walking in all his ways, <coughs> and cleaving unto him. Then the promise will come to pass, God will drive out all the enemies all the enemy nation, which is a type of driving all the demons out. Otherwise, many people want to cast out the demons, but they're not willing to keep the commandments, do them and love the Lord, walk in all his ways and cleave to him. It's not going to happen. These things are prerequisites that show that you love him so that then, remember, then he will accomplish these things to drive the enemies out of your life. You see, we got to have our priorities in line. We can't just try to get delivered of a problem and think that everything's going to be fine if we don't love the Lord by walking in His ways, doing His commandments, and obeying it. In fact, God's going to prove you and find out whether you really do or not. You can't just say, I do. No, He's going to say, well, let's see whether you really do. Deuteronomy 13.3 Thou shalt not hearken to the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, or tests you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. He's going to find out by your walk, by your actions, by what you're doing, what you're doing with his word. The proof is going to be shown forth. You'll see this later when we look at some things over in the New Testament. We also pointed out earlier, but we'll just point it out again, you show that you love the Lord when you choose the things that he expects you to choose. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, where he said to choose life, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life, as he said, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God. If you don't make the right choices, you don't love the Lord your God. You say, how can someone tell me that I don't love the Lord your God? God's word tells you. If you don't choose the things that he tells you to, then you really don't love him. It's shown by your actions in life, and that is so important. We see over in Joshua 22. In Joshua 22, in verse 5, take diligent heed. That means you just don't just casually do things if it fits into your schedule and your lifestyle, if I have time to, and so forth. Oh, no. This is priorities. These are priorities in your life. Diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which the Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments, cleave unto him, serve him with all your heart and all your soul. This is, this is on and on and on. You see this many, many times. If we looked at all the scriptures, we'd be here all day just looking at all the scriptures that talk about this throughout the word of God, continually pouring this truth into them. The conditions that are necessary. Joshua 23, verse 11. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves, that you love the Lord your God. Be, take heed, or will guard, watchful. Make sure that you're loving the Lord. Again, it's not an ad that obviously means it's not an attitude of mind. Why would I need to guard and take heed and make sure that I'm loving the Lord? Because it's shown in action. It's shown in the things you do. It's shown in your lifestyle. It's shown by the fruit, the things that you're doing in your life. Over in Judges, we see something interesting. Now, this is in the context of Delilah speaking to Samson 
but there's still a truth that's spoken here. Here she said unto him, Why, how canst thou say, I love thee, when mine, mine heart is not with me? Well, that's true. And she deceived him from that, of course, to get him to tell all the reason how, what, where his source of strength was. But still, this is a truth. How can you say you love God if your heart's not with him? You can't just go through the motions. You gotta be genuine. You gotta be the real deal. It's shown by your, where your heart is. And your heart shows your motivations, your desires. And it'll be shown by actions in your life, the things that you do. At the same time, the God, God's Word tells us that you know, we, there's things we shouldn't love, things we need to stay away from. Psalms 4, verse 2. O oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after Leasing. The word leasing actually means lies and untruths and falsehoods and deceptive things. I don't know why it's translated that. I have no idea. It really means a lie. You can't love vain things and seek after lies, anything that's contrary to the word, and think that you really love the Lord. We can't be seeking after vain things, vanity, things that are worthless, that are not going to help you spiritually in your life. Everything of the world is all not of the Father. Everything out there, all the things of the flesh is coming from sin that dwells in the flesh. That's why you've got to deny yourself, crucify the flesh, not be conformed to this world, turn away from it. Don't be loving after vain things of this world. Psalms 5, verse 11. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. You need to love the name of the Lord because the name of the Lord brings him on the scene personally present to manifest himself and that's like the power of attorney brings his power, his authority into manifestation to bring forth the promises. When you call on the name of the Lord, he shows up. You should love the name of the Lord. You can call on his name and he will show up and manifest himself and bring promises and, and you cast out the demons in the name of Jesus. You drive all these out. Love the name of the Lord. Don't ever take it for granted. Psalms 31, verse 23. O oh, love the Lord, all you saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. That shows you something else. What shows you that you really love the Lord? Well, you're faithful. You're faithful to do what he says. And you're a proud doer of the word. You're doing the word. It's shown in your lifestyle. It's shown by the things that you do. What you, your walk in your life. And what, notice he's going to preserve you. He's going to reward you. That means great blessings are going to come upon the person. He's talking about the saints, which are the holy ones, the ones that are holy, walking godly. That's what he expects of every single one of us. If you're going to meet the conditions to really show that you love the Lord. Psalms 40, verse 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be gladly. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. You should love the salvation, the deliverance, all the things that God's provided for you. Even though you have a, you're involved in working out your salvation, working out your deliverance, working out all these things, it's spiritual work that you're involved in and in seeing these things be accomplished, casting out the demons, speaking the word, praying, taking hold of things, doing the word in order to see the promises come to pass, praying diligently. But you're going to love the salvation of the Lord as you're going to magnify the Lord for what he has provided for you. Psalm 69, over in verse 36. The seed also of a servant shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. You're going to dwell in the inherited promised land, which is the promises of God if you love the name of the Lord. Over in Psalms 97, it tells us, though, something. Again, there's things that we should hate in our life. Psalms 97, verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. If you hate evil enough, you'll never be involved in it. If there's a kind of food that you hate, you cannot stand that. It's the last thing you're going to put in your mouth. You hate something, it's the last thing you're going to let it come into your life. I hate evil. You should hate anything that God considers that's evil. He hates sin. He hates unrighteousness. He hates all these things. 
You that love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. He does not want you involved in any evil in your life whatsoever. Anything that's contrary to his word would be evil. Psalms 119, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It's my meditation all, thy, all the day. And, of course, the, the law that we're talking about is now the law in the New Testament. Remember, we're not under the Old Testament law. We're under the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty in the New Testament. And notice, if you really love the law, it'll be your meditation all the day. You'll be thinking on the Word throughout the day. If you don't think about the Word throughout the day, you, you know, you get through your day and you think at the very end of it, well, I forgot, didn't even think about God's Word or anything about Him today. How much are you really loving Him? If you love him, your meditation will be upon the word, on his laws, on the things that he says. You'll be thinking about the Lord throughout your day. That shows him. You know, if, you're, if he's not even in your thoughts all the day, there's a problem. The wicked, he's not even in their thoughts, as the scripture says. Psalms 119, verse 113. I hate vain thoughts. Vain thoughts, the word here is means that are divided and half-hearted. Otherwise, he doesn't want you to have a divided mind. One minute you're on, one minute you're off, one minute you're in the things of the flesh and sin, one minute you're thinking the things of the Lord. No. He wants a, a, not a divided heart or even doing things half-heartedly. He wants you doing things with all of your heart. Remember, you love him with all your heart and have your mind focused upon him. You can't do things halfway. Remember, the double-minded man, he's unstable in all of his ways. And the guy who's double-minded, he can't take hold of anything of the Lord. I mean, you've got to give your all to him. He gave his all for you. How can you not give your all to him? If you really love him, you'll give your all to him. He says, and thy law do I love. I love the word. I hate to have any of these things coming into my mind. Do not let the devil get to your mind with evil thoughts, negative thoughts. You take your thoughts captive. You think on good things. You govern your mind. Do not let yourself have a divided or half-hearted in anything you do. You do everything with all of your heart. Psalms 119, verse 119. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross. That's right. That's what's going to happen to them. Therefore, I love thy testimonies. Hey, I'm going to love the testimonies of the Lord. I'm going to walk in his ways. I'm going to keep my eyes on him because I'm not about to be, any, be like the wicked because they're going to be put away. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be judged. In verse 127, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. You love his word even above gold or all the money in the world. It's amazing how people will sell out for money when all of a sudden money comes on the scene and they kind of forget God and they forget all their priorities in life and start going after money. That shows where their heart is. There's a problem. They're covetous at heart. We love his commandments above gold or above fine gold whatsoever. We see again in verse 132 about loving his name. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. You love the name of the Lord. And you love his word. Uh, verse 140, thy word is very pure. Therefore the servant loveth it. It's pure. It's been tested. It's been proved. God's word will always work. Don't ever think for a minute, well, I don't know if God will perform his word. You believed a lie. You let the devil have place in you. No. You love the word of God. It is very pure. It has been tested. It is the truth, and God will bring it to pass. In 159, consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. See if God sees you're loving his precepts, his statutes, his, his word, his ways. Then he's going to manifest his loving kindness toward you. It's going to show up in your life. You see, the way you treat God is the way he's going to treat you. You love him, he's going to love you and manifest himself to you in your life. 163. I hate and abhor lying. God doesn't want you lying. He doesn't want you to tell half-truths or little white lies or whatever you want to call them. Anything that's not the truth, it's a lie. But thy law do I love. You should hate and abhor lying. You're not going to tell any lies. No. Verse 165. 
Great peace have they which love thy law. Look at the result that happens when you love the word of God. You're going to have great peace. And where's that coming from? It's coming from God. And nothing shall offend them. This means to cause you to stumble, what the word means. You got put the word of God first place and you love it, you'll never stumble. You'll walk in the way of the Lord. You won't sin. If you're having all these stumbles and all these problems that seem like they're happening, yeah, you don't love the word. You need to make a change and repent. Change your ways, your mind, your action. Love the word so you will not stumble anymore in life. And you're going to have great peace. See, people that walk in sin, they don't have any peace. <laughs> the way of the transgressor is hard. They're in turmoil. Verse 167, My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. How much of a love do you have for God's word? If you really have it, you'll be in it all the time. You'll be studying it all the time. You'll be listening to it all the time. You realize this is life. This is what I need. This is how God's going to manifest himself. This is how I'm going to know him and how I'm going to walk with him. Psalms 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <clears throat> they shall prosper that love thee. God wants you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem for Israel. He wants them to be at peace. If you will love them, which is shown by praying for them, it will contribute towards your prosperity. God wants you to prosper. You love the things that God loves, he'll prosper you. He wants you to love the things that he loves at all times in your life. We see over in Proverbs, chapter 8, and we've mentioned this several times, but here's a scripture that shows it clear. Proverbs eight seventeen, I love them that love me. Now, this is not a contradiction, as we mentioned, about how God loves us unconditionally, regardless of what we do. Remember, there's two aspects to love. One, unconditional. Two, conditional for him to manifest. This is talking about his con conditions being met for him to manifest himself. I love them that love me. Those that seek me early shall find me. This is when God is going to show up. In fact, look at the tremendous promise that's given here that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. That means prosperity is tied into you loving God. You want to prosper? You're going to have to love God. You know, people that just want to go out there, I've seen people that are able to prosper, but seem like that they've had bags with holes in it, and all the money just seems to go out all the time. They got all, all these things just keep happening, and it just seems like it's, they never retain their prosperity, and everything just seems to fall apart. Are they really loving the Lord? If you love the Lord, he'll inherit, you'll inherit substance, and he'll fill your treasures. You will be prosperous. You will be blessed. God wants us to be blessed in all the things that we do. Proverbs 16, verse 13 the righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. You learn to speak right, God will love you, because your words are important. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can be taken or snared with the words of your mouth. Your words can minister life, your words can minister death, they can minister evil things, they can be destructive towards people, or they can be bringing blessing. God wants you to speak right words. Learn to speak right because your words are release, words release in your mouth. Speaking them is releasing things. You've got to learn to speak the right things. Over in Micah, chapter 6, he says over here in verse 8, He has showed me, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. This is what he requires of us. To do justly, according to righteousness, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You're to do righteousness, do what's right. You're to love mercy. You're to show mercy. We're not going to be judgmental people. We're going to love mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And to walk humbly with your God at all times in your life. That's what God wants. In the New Testament, if you really love God, you can't have somebody else above the Lord, shown by the way you act. Matthew 10, verse 37 says, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now this love is, is the word phileo that we've seen. 
So this is talking about where you are showing by your actions the conditions that are shown forth in your life that you're loving father and mother or son or daughter more than the Lord. You're not worthy of him. Is he going to manifest himself? No. Is he going to love you as far as manifesting his love towards you? No way. You're going to be in trouble. You can't be doing that whatsoever. He that taketh not his cross, which is the crucify of the flesh, and followeth after me, the word, is not worthy of me either. He's not going to manifest himself to the people that will not crucify the flesh, which is taking your cross daily, and following after him, which is the word of God. Therefore, you and I cannot ever put anybody before the Lord. That means you can't compromise the word of God for father, for mother, for son, for daughter, for anybody on the face of the earth. Do not compromise the word. doesn't matter. Well, my husband says this, or my wife says this, or my son says this, or daughter says this, or whatever. You're not going to compromise the word, or you're in trouble. You're not worthy of the Lord. You've got to choose to do the word. We see too much compromise in people. You cannot compromise anything. You've got to do what the word says if you really love them. You can't be a man pleaser and be a God pleaser at the same time. It doesn't fit. You also got to watch that you're not affected by the evil and the lawlessness out there in this world. This is in the end time chapter in Matthew 24, verse 12. Because iniquity, the word iniquity, I put the cursor over iniquity, it's a Greek word anomia. Nomos means law, a means without, this means lawlessness, without law. Or as Young's brings out, lawlessness. Because lawlessness shall abound. What do we see happening even in this country now? We got people, we got leaders in our country that ignore laws. They ignore them. We got a president that ignores laws. We got a Congress that ignores laws. We got all kinds of judges that ignore laws and make their own. What a mess. We got a lawless spirit that's come in. That's why you got to bind that thing and cast that down. And the God will bring righteousness into positions of authority. Because lawlessness shall abound, and it will abound in the last days, unfortunately. It's in all the nations that are not saved, for sure. What happens, though? The love of many shall wax cold. That means lawlessness, if you let it get a hold of you, it'll affect you in your life, and it'll cause your love, your agape love, to wax cold. Notice it says the love of many, in contrast to the few. Who are the many? The many are walking the broad way that leads to destruction, the word says. Who are the few that are walking the narrow way that leads to life? Therefore, because lawlessness is abounding, then the love, the agape love of many, it's going to wax cold. Remember what happens to the lukewarm? They're spewed out of his mouth. What's going to happen to the cold? They're finished for sure. That means you've got to guard yourself from lawlessness. Spiritual lawlessness, any kind of lawlessness, do not compromise the Word of God just because everybody else out there is doing it. You've got to walk before the Lord and do what is right in the sight of the Lord. You cannot compromise because of what others are doing or have done or what the laws are out there. doesn't matter what the laws are out there. Oh, it's legal. doesn't matter. Oh, it's legal to do this and all these things. It doesn't matter what's legal in the world. It only matters what's right before God. Luke chapter six, 7, verse 44. Here's when he turned to the woman, said to Simon, Seeth thou this woman, I entered in thine house, I gave me no water from my feet, she's washed my feet with tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head, gave me no kiss. The woman, this is the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint, and this woman has anointed my feet with ointment, Wherefore I say unto her, sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The point is, if you haven't dealt with your sins, you've been forgiven of little, then you love little. In the measure that you have been forgiven is the measure that you'll love, because you have dealt with those sins. If you're not a person who's really operating in love, then you must have a lot of sins that are operating in your life. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. God expects you to love much, and he wants you to be forgiven of everything. That means deal with everything in your life. 
Don't just deal with a few things and then let's kind of sweep the rest of them underfoot and think that it doesn't matter. Oh no, it matters. God wants everything dealt with in our life. So important. We must do what he says. John chapter 15. And God wants you to come to the place of abiding in his love. Otherwise, continuing it all the time. John 15, 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. He expects us to continue in it. Not that we just, you know, once in a while operate in it. This is the way you live. This is you abide in it. You remain in it all the time. This is the way you walk. This means to remain in it. Also, if you are going to walk in God's love, you're going to be holy before him. Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You're operating in love. You're going to walk in holiness without blame. You're going to deal with all the sin. You can't be walking in unholy things and think that you love God. You're kidding yourself. It's a lie. Don't believe these things. And what does God see? He looks and sees whether or not you're the real deal. And we see in 2 Corinthians 2.9, he said, For to this end did I also did I write that I might know the proof of you. Remember we saw about he's going to he's proven them in the Old Testament. The proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. And this shows the fact that you're loving him. Because verse 8 says, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. How's your love shown? Because you're obedient in all things. Otherwise, in the measure of your obedience, the measure you love God. Little obedience, little loving God. Little doing of the word, little loving of God. Oh, I do a couple scriptures every once in a while. No, you should be doing the, what the word says. That's the way you live all the time in everything you do. Otherwise, you do not have the love of God established in you. Look at what he says down here in 2 Corinthians 8.8. 8. He says here at the end, he says, to prove the sincerity of your love, or the genuineness this means. Prove if it's a real thing. God is going to prove the genuineness of your love. And we see it again when he comes down to 20, verse 24. About, he said, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love. This is where they committed to help these churches to reach out and minister to their needs that they were having in their life. Show the proof of your love. You can't just say you're going to do something and then not carry it out. God wants you to be one who's walking in the ways of love. First John, at the same time, can you be loving the things and the things of this world? No. Love not the world. First John 2:15. Neither the things that are in the world. Hey, this world is under judgment. It's going down, and it's going to go down. It's run by the God of this age, Satan. Jesus is going to come back, and he is going to destroy, bring forth his judgment, and he is going to bring forth his millennial reign. Until he comes, things aren't going to be right in this world, that's for sure. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's why, what, don't, wait, don't do it, these time wasters out there in the world, these things that draw you away and all these things that are time wasters and taking you down a path of destruction. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. And what's going to happen to the world? The world passes away. Everybody's like that's going to pass away. And the lust thereof, you can't be following the lust. He that doeth the will of God, that's the one who abides forever. That's obviously the one who loves the Lord. And this isn't someone, oh, I did it once in a while. No, present tense. This is the guy who's doing continuously the will of God. This is the way he lives. In other words, if you're a real Christian that loves God, you live the word. You do the word. You hear and do the word. It's your life. It's not just sign on the dotted line and then go live in the flesh and the world and do whatever I want and run my life forever. No. No. It doesn't work that way. You're going to come in line with walking in his ways if you really are showing forth you love him. 1 John 4, 21. This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. 
Can you have any resentment or bitterness or hatred or unforgiveness or negative attitudes towards another person and think that you love God? No way. You must forgive every person. You must let go of all resentments, bitterness. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, they may have done a real evil thing to you, but you've got to forgive them because it's going to cost you. If you won't forgive men their trespasses, God won't forgive you of yours. Well, you're stuck in your own sins. Forgive them. They were just a vessel of the devil. God will deliver you and heal you from the effects of it as you cast out the demons and take hold of his promises. You can be set free. Don't make the mistake and ever get a negative attitude against a brother. He who loves God loves his brother also. It's mandatory. 1 John 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Well, if you love God and keep his commandments, you'll never have a negative attitude against a brother or any of the children of God whatsoever. But this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So the love of God is shown in action, isn't it? It's not an attitude of mind only. It is shown in action by keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. He expects you and I to do what he says. And don't ever make the mistake like what he talks about in Revelation chapter 2, here was the church at Ephesus. What did they do? He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you left your first love. The first love was the Lord, and walk in line with his word and keep his commandments, and they left it. They were in trouble. They were called on the carpet. And if they would not repent, he was going to come and remove their candlestick out of their place. The light would be gone. They'd be in trouble. Never. Leave your first love. First love meant they got a second love. Something else came in there. No. The Lord has to be your first love and the Word of God, and you're not ever going to turn and walk in any other ways. It does come down to your walk. Second John, verse 6. This is love, that we walk after His commandments. It shows the definitions, what love is, real clear. Walking after His commandments. It's doing what he says, the walk consistently in your life. And as you do this, you're going to see, you're going to come to the place where love is going to be perfected because the love of God is to be perfected in every single one of us. In fact, we see in 1 John 2, 3, hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's the only way you're going to know God, by keeping his commandments. And as you... He says, anybody that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments, he's a liar. The truth's not in him. You can't say you know God and not keep his commandments. You're kidding yourself. You will not, you only know God in a measure that you keep his commandments. Whoso keepeth his word, what else happens? In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. The love of God is to become perfected and complete in your life. We're to grow up in all things. And remember the love that he has, the Father has for Jesus, is supposed to be in us, as we read in John 17, was well, you keep the word of God, the love of God will be perfected in you. And you're going to be like him, because you're going to walk like him. We are to be changed into the very image of Jesus Christ, and we are to become like him, so that when he appears, we'll be exactly like him, because we're walking in love, walking in his word at all times. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that brings revelation of your love towards us and our love towards you. I understand your unconditional love in sending Jesus Christ to pay the price for sin, to accomplish redemption, even while we were sinners, no conditions on our part to be met. But I also understand that your love is conditional, shown toward us when we meet the conditions. You love those who love you, ones who have your commandments and keep them, really love you. And then we'll be loved of the Father and you'll come and manifest yourself in our life. I thank you. I'm putting the Word of God and the commandments of the New Testament first place in my life. 
I will be a hearer of the word. I will do the word. I will have the walk, not the talk only, but I am a doer of the word of God. I am walking in the commandments, showing forth that I really love you. And I thank you that I will deal with all sins in my life. For as I am forgiven, so do I love God. I also will not let myself be contaminated by lawlessness or anything that is not of the Lord. I hate evil. I hate vain thoughts. I hate vain things, lies, anything contrary to the word of God. I hate them all. I love the name of the Lord, the word of God, his commandments, his way. I love the Lord, shown forth, because I have his word. I keep his commandments. I walk in them. And it is evident in my life. As I keep the word, the love of God is perfected in me. And I will know the Lord and I will have eternal life. And the Lord will manifest himself and bring forth all his promises. As I do the word, he will show his love manifest in my life. He loves those who love him. And he will prosper me. He will fill me with treasures. He will bless me in everything that I do because I show that I love him. I thank you, Lord. I understand the truth. I understand your love unconditionally, shown through what you've done, but I also understand that your love is only shown when I meet the conditions to see your promises come to pass. I will show forth my love towards you because I obey. I keep the commandments. The proof is shown. The genuineness is shown because I obey. I keep your word. I do what you say. I have the walk. I walk in your commandments all the days of my life. I meditate on your word throughout the word, uh, throughout the day. I put your word first place in all that I do, evidenced by my lifestyle. Thank you, Lord. I show forth that I love you. And because of that, you will love me and you will manifest yourself and bring your blessings to pass in my life. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I trust this has helped you to understand the love of God. Many people have had a, quite a distorted view of it. Many people think that God just automatically loves you and that's it. It doesn't matter what I do. Well, that's true in one aspect. But then they wonder why he doesn't do anything in their life. Because they haven't met the conditions loving him. It's a two-way street when we come to seeing him come and manifest himself. And we see now from the word that we are to truly love him and respond with love back to him, evidenced by what we do with his word. Father, I thank you for the revelation that's been brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word, and we will abide in your love and abiding in you, and we will see you manifest yourself mightily in our life. Thank you for the love unconditionally, and also your conditional love shown forth that you expect us to walk in line with your ways, the word of the covenant. We will be a doer of your word, and we will see your love manifested in our life as you bring forth all your promises and perform your word. We praise you. We will be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.